On this episode of Kayla vs. Self, I get to speak with Janet Batch, a singer-songwriter from the New York Finger Lakes region. We talk about her lyrical style, some of the stories behind the songs that she has written, and her inspiration behind some of the things that I enjoyed, especially the character Jim Steve in Mary Lou. You can stream her new album, You Be the Wolf, on Spotify, Apple Music, or SoundCloud. You can also find her on Bandcamp or her website, JanetBatch.com. You can also follow Caleb vs. Self on Instagram, or you can reach out at Caleb vs. Self at gmail.com for any comments, suggestion, or any other general banter. Hopefully you enjoy this conversation, and again, thank you for listening. bot there so hopefully that works out the way i'm looking for janet thank you so much for coming on first and foremost well thank you for having me yeah um so the new album is out uh you be the wolf what for that album especially for your sophomore album was the most difficult was it dealing with covid and recording this in two chunks or what was the whole circumstance behind this this particular album um wow there's a lot to cover here um covid definitely interrupted the process. Um, we had gone into the studio for two sessions over the winter of 19 and 20. And then COVID happened in March, I would say. And then it just slowed everything down. Like we probably would have been back in the studio listening to mixes and, um, and tweaking mixes and layering more tracks, but we didn't know about the safety of that. So It took us a long time to kind of figure out how to negotiate being around one another in the studio because we did it as a group. Um, We didn't just like have a producer take it and and do it. We were doing it as a band. So we would sit around and eventually we ended up sitting around in masks and listening to the mixes and, um, and contributing that way. So that, that was a challenge and, but it was also, I think a blessing in disguise because I ended up taking my time with a lot more parts that I thought were all buttoned up. And sometimes that can be a bad thing. Like when you don't know when to stop tweaking things and the project just doesn't end, but I was grateful to have the opportunity to like really dig things, dig into things more. And then, um, I also spent a lot more time on my packaging because I had that extra time and put a lot more energy and creativity into the, the booklet that um, the CD's in and then the album cover for the vinyl. Uh, so okay. I'm really proud of it. I think it worked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what was that learning curve for the first album? Because I have to imagine that with the first album, there's a lot of sitting, listening, trying to mix. And I feel like probably spending more time um, on that portion of it. Whereas this time around with more time, you're, you're able to kind of open it up and, and get a few more things done to promote the second album. W- would you say that's true or? I, yeah, it's, it's very true. It's very true. I mean, we did a publicity campaign um, to promote the record, which I, I just wouldn't have had time to do it if I tried to release it in, like summer of 2020. I just didn't have my ducks in a row for that. Um, so going back to the, the first album, um, it, was, it was just an entirely different process for the first record. A, a huge learning curve. I had no idea what I was doing then. And um, definitely more of an idea on what we liked, what we wanted to do and what we didn't want to do for the second record, which is an entirely different band as well. So Mm -hmm. different experiences and different um, influences and everything just added up to that. Gotcha. The first album being a good woman is hard to find. That was in 2017. Uh, Again, the newest one, you be the wolf just released a couple of weeks ago. So Mm -hmm. congratulations. I'm sure that's also extremely exciting. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, it's crazy. It's very crazy. Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Given COVID though, when do you think, I know you just did something in Rochester not too long ago. I believe it was Nashville. I could be wrong. Um, oh, it's called Abilene. Abilene. My apologies. Yep. Yep. Um, do you think hopefully sometime soon you guys will be able to start doing a little bit more of a run with the new album? Or do you feel like that's going to take a little more time? Uh, I, 
I'm hoping as soon as possible. Um, it feels like COVID's like kicking back up into gear right now. And um, there's some hesitancy with people being indoors. Um, so it'll probably be more like spring when we get really going. Gotcha. And yeah. I know you're from the greater Ithaca, I guess, area, or I shouldn't say Ithaca, Utica. Well, I, I live near Ithaca now, but I was uh, born in the Utica area and Oops. grew up there. And do you focus typically more of your shows and touring? Is it Does it tend to be more central Western New York? Are you able to get to other places? Have you been to other places? I ha- we, haven't, we haven't gotten much further than central Western New York, <laughs> to be honest. No, we're still a really young band um, in, in some regards. Like I, I did the album before with a different band, but this, um, this lineup is, is relatively new. Sid, our guitarist, joined in, I would, it, it was mostly, we were almost through 2018 before he got on a, a show with us. And then the drummer was added during the recording process because he, was actually the engineer and he owned he owns the studio as well so we were there getting ready to record and then found our, ourselves in need of a drummer and he he fit the bill completely so it really started developing in early 2020 gotcha and for yeah. for those guys i, I think mm-hmm. i have them crisscrossed i could be wrong is it mike that does rhythm and chris on bass or the other way around the other way around okay Yep, My Chris is on so drums. Chris, Chris Plus on drums and Mike Brando on bass. Mm-hmm. With that entire process, writing itself is really what caught my ear to your music. And I know, you know, from, from doing some reading here, um, people have said, and I think you included in some ways, you know, similar to like a Johnny Cash, Patty Griffin type of, of style. How would you kind of, explain to somebody your lyrics in particular i know they they come from some stories with a Mm -hmm. little bit of of flair i think you've said before Mm -hmm. Uh, how would you kind of explain that or extrapolate that for somebody who maybe hasn't listened to you know country or folk that type of of music in some time that's a tough one um (laughs) i i think the first thought I came up with when you were t- saying that is that I write a lot of times I write in ways that you can see in your mind when you hear it. Um, I think about authors that like that touch me that way. And it would be like John Steinbeck, you know, when you're reading some of his work, I, I maybe not everybody, I'm sure that not everyone sees what they're reading in their minds, but um, that's, that's kind of how, people have told me I write and I like to use that kind of language where it's like painting a picture in a way, but it's not entirely like that because I have lots of exceptions to that rule as well. Um, where I just want to write a simple, fast, don't think that much about it too. Gotcha. Yeah. So so in regard to that, I guess, Mm -hmm. let me jump over to a song. Um, Mm -hmm. Lavetta, which I read was inspired by a neighbor um, Mm -hmm. who went through a difficult time, you know, we'll put it that way. And at the time you didn't necessarily fully understand the circumstances. So you kind of built a story around it. Is that something that you've carried with you all the way through, all the way up to today with lyrics and writing? Um, You mean, did I carry her, her made up story or do you, do you mean style that I write? This, yeah, the style, like how you go through the process of of coming up with that story with flair, as it were. Yeah, I think, I think I do. Like, it's almost easier for me to make something up than to get all of the details. I think, if I'm answering that correctly. Um, yeah. 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 Like, I, there, I eventually found out why she was having such a hard time. Mm-hmm. And what I made up works, but it's not at all what she was going through. I mean, basically, I imply that she's like got postpartum depression in in the song. But she, when she went through that time, and uh, she was in her fifties, 
So she wasn't having a, you know, she didn't have a newborn. Right. Um, but that song kind of just, I didn't sit down and think, I'm going to write this song about this woman who tries to commit suicide because she can't handle being a mother. Like it, that did not happen. <laughs> like I just right, like, right. stared out the window and it, it all just like kind of came out and it all, um, it just happened that way. Um, I was going to say something else, but I forgot it. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Okay. So for that writing process, you know, mm-hmm. I've heard people before talk about having like a habit of just like writing everything down or, or they go through a process until finally something clicks. Mm-hmm. Would, would you say that's true for you or do you feel like they come a little bit more naturally for you, these stories or these lyrics? Um, I definitely don't write them down. I don't have a habit of writing either. Sure. But I lately have been been asked this question and kind of in the, uh, what, ha- what happens is I end up feeling like I'm being pursued by a song. Um, Lavetta felt very like gradual and gentle. It didn't feel like something was hounding me, but, okay. um, I like when I come up with lyrics, I, I have a line that I kind of like, and then I keep singing it over and over. And I kind of like, envision it's I don't envision anything but like it's sort of like a wheel is turning with that lyric on it over and over again until it like another lyric like jumps on and it works okay um out of all like the things that you know I could be saying and what rhymes and what you know what meter works um it's it's very you know how to describe it other than it's fun of repetition until the right things come to place so it's cyclical in nature, just continues, Very cyclical. continues until a piece maybe latches on and then it continues and continues until maybe yeah. another piece. Yeah, I envision like a okay. clock, you know, like the, the gears on a clock, like one turns one way and then the other turns the other and they kind of they interact with one another. But um, that's how that's the best I can come up with when it comes to like how how I write. That, and that's incredible. It's very different from what like a lot of people tell me, at least as far as like lyric writing is concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's like the, you know, Eminem style guys who just, oh, they always have a notepad or they always have their yeah. thing out, you know, their, their, um, their cell phone. Right. And they're jotting this note, that note, that note, and then they'll go back yeah. and they'll reread everything. Whereas for you, it seems that it's just something hooks in your brain. Mm-hmm. And you continue to almost use it as a mantra until something else gets connected. Yeah. It's like a rumination, but not every song's like that. My, sure. I think my songs that I'm most proud of lyrically are like that. Then other songs, maybe I written things down and take two thoughts and smash them together, and it becomes a song. Mm. For um, you, for you as an artist, is there one that really jumps out particularly that you're proud of? On this record, um, oh gosh. I, I'm really proud of um, Waiting on Horses. I mean, I'm proud of all of them for different reasons. Um, Waiting on Horses is, like, rhythmically, the way the lyrics are percussive. Um, I really really like it. I like the economy of the words and the interspersement of, like, these hoots and hollers and yodels that happen. and then radio is so simple, it has so few words, but and it's an entirely different song. And I, I like that one just as much in a way because of its, I don't know, sparseness. Um, that one really caught my attention. That was the first one I actually mm-hmm. listened to of all of, of, of the songs. And I remember mm-hmm. sitting there. And after like a minute went by, I was just like almost dozing off. And I was like, wait, is this, <laughs> are there lyrics? Does somebody sing? Yeah, it's a real slow burn. It is. It is. But mm-hmm. there's something uh I assume the western kind of feel is intentional. Um, Definitely. Yeah. That vibes of just I don't know, like a real slow western town. <laughs> totally. Really cool. That's that's exactly what we were going for. That style has been referred to as a spaghetti western um okay. theme. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that um it's Eastwood kind of movie where there's a whistle and like some weird noises and yeah, you, well, you know that something's going to happen. 
I'm no music expert, but it sounds like you hit the nail on the head with me. <laughs> yeah, perfect. That's exactly what we were going for. So for some of the other songs, let's, could, if you don't mind, I would like to move over to Sarah Ann. Um, sure. I was reading that that song was inspired by the disappearance of of a particular young lady in 1993 that mm-hmm. it sounds like maybe did that kind of stick with you for a long time? Just the age and, and where you were in life at that point or? Um, yeah. The, how old are you? I'm 32. Okay. You are much younger than probably most people who would remember this. Um, but this was a huge, huge, huge piece of news in New York state in 1993. Um, and Sarah Ann is Sarah Ann Wood, and she was my neighbor, and she disappeared, and she's only a couple of years younger than me. So it was in our town, and it was, it was just this thing that happened, and it became a huge news story. It was like in the early 90s, you know, things started really changing with how the news happened. You know, that was like OJ was happening and like Rodney King was happening. So like when things got legs on the news, they just got legs they never had before. And I believe like it was one of the biggest missing person cases ever because it was it was like a national news item. So aside from that, which is only a piece of the story. um. Yeah, she, her disappearance was it, it affected it probably affected everybody in in some way. Being her age, being from just a few miles away, you just like never really stop thinking about it. And I had a very very active imagination when I was in college, and I would like which if you listen to the words about in the very beginning where it's like. I used to see you on the shoulder, not a single day older, but I was lost and I was tired and I was stoned. Like I would drive back and forth to college in the middle of the night and be high and let my imagination like run wild and be like, Oh God, like, like afraid of a ghost kind of thing. Like what would I see out there on the highway? Um, But then just at the end of 2019, between studio sessions, Sarah Ann was written, and it was it was one that hounded me. It was something I thought I would do, and I didn't really know what shape it was going to take, meaning I was planning on writing about her disappearance. And then something sparked, and the song took me, like, months to write in a way like it's it came out almost entirely at first and then I heavily edited it and changed the melody and I really really lived with it for months and it was a very very dark time to be honest for you writing that particular song Mm -hmm. was there any sort of a, a a particular release for you maybe like a unburdening of thinking about it or do you feel like that's something that still sticks with you and probably will for um i i think it'll stick with me for a long long time i think mm-hmm. that it was some sort of like um reprocessing because i don't i never really thought about it much like a grown up would think about it you know i thought about it as a kid which was like really simple kind of this happened and that's that. But when you think about it as a person who's as old as her parents were when she disappeared, it just, it just changed the whole thing, you know? And then during the time that she disappeared, I was like just starting high school and going through tons of changes and some stuff was going on in my family. And just like, it was, it just felt like, I don't know, like a grieving about adolescence or something in a way. Yeah. That's yeah. Very. Uh, that coming through in your work, I feel like it shows to some degree, obviously I don't know the depth of all of that, but it definitely feels like there's um, 
you know, maybe a little more there as far as that story. Like, mm-hmm. like you aren't necessarily done with it. Um, yeah. It sounds like you, you, you won't be. Obviously, that would be a, you know, a very difficult thing to to really think about. And I can only imagine driving through, especially in that section of New York State. Like, there's not that many street lights. There's, you know, it's, oh, no. it's probably dark when you're going back and forth, right? <laughs> oh yeah, it was like you know, one o'clock in the morning in the middle of the winter, driving through Central New. For sure. Dude, that's a special kind of eerie mm-hmm. to begin mm-hmm. with. And then, yeah. and then to put all that in there, I'm, I'm sure is pretty wild. Yeah. It was just like this thing that haunted me, you know, and, and, and just, you know, stuck around in my consciousness mm-hmm. throughout my whole life. It's just like this, you just like move through the world and then you're like, oh my God, they still don't know where she is. She's right not been found like that's just so unsettling just the uncertainty yeah. of life as a whole i guess it reminds you of that right you're not in control necessarily oh yeah that yeah there's a lot <laughs> of things i feel like i was learning writing the song and, and learning about what i thought about the world back then and and what unfortunately we know about the world now and yeah there's a quote on uh guitar girl magazine where you say the voice in my head sometimes sounds like an old man. Is that mm-hmm. one of those moments you feel like where you have that kind of, I, I imagine it for you as like a grizzled old man sitting on a porch, just giving you that life advice or that reminder every once in a while. Would that be an accurate de- depiction of, of that? Yeah. Yeah. Old man, if you will. Sure. Sure. Like I think when I think of some of the language that I use, especially in um, waiting on horses, mm-hmm. like, I use the word nary and I've never said that word. I've never said that word until I wrote it in that song. Um, so things like that happen where I'm like, who's, whose voice is this? You know? And I was around my grandparents a lot when I was really young. So I think that some of that brushed off on me for sure. Like gotcha. the, their, their ways of speaking and like, lots of phrases that they would use and and things like that so yeah that seems to be a theme through a lot of it is perspective regardless yeah. of who is is looking at that particular situation in the song it's all very perspective based and I, I think that's really unique as far as you know especially here when you talk about sign you know sometimes there's like an old man talking mm-hmm. um, it feels like that's a lot of perspectives do you consciously try to write in a particular like frame of reference or again, does that just lyric for lyric just occur in that cyclical motion and and it just is what it is? I usually have a, um, I usually have a perspective set, but sometimes it's gets swapped around in the song and that's intentional. Like in, in, if I had a nickel, I wrote the first two verses in the chorus from a man's perspective and then the response is the woman's perspective um and that that was definitely intentional i i usually have that right at the, at the get-go like what what point of view it's going to be from gotcha yeah what do you get or how do you i should say as you said you're right you're writing from the man's perspective do you try mm-hmm. to actually put themselves put yourself in that sh- space in sure. order to to find that frame of reference or is there someone that you draw from that maybe you know kind of in day-to-day life gives you a little bit more perspective of that particular kind of side of the story um and typically i'm writing about real events i'm not writing about a real event i'm using a real person for that perspective and it's not necessarily somebody i'm around it could be, you know, a mashup of a bunch of people that I, that I know or a stereotype of a person. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's briefly dive into something else that you worked on. And that was some of uh, your music videos and your recent music promotion there. I have to ask, right. Uh-huh. As you bring up stereotypes. Uh huh. Where does Jim Steve and Mary Lou come from? <laughs> it's so funny because I was thinking about Jim Steve when I was like a mashup. Like Jim Steve is like my dad, 
my brothers, <laughs> every guy I ever dated. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Jim Steve is the amalgamation of a whole bunch of different male figures in your life. Totally. <laughs> and how about Mary Lou? Is that like you plus a lot of different female? Like, does Mary Lou have that same space or is that a little bit different than that's, than you know, you? it's funny that I named her Mary Lou because my grandmother had a, like a best girlfriend named Mary Lou and she was, she was glamorous. And like, they, we were, we lived in the, the middle of nowhere, mm-hmm. but you know, there was some country charm and some hair to be done and some makeup to be done and some Avon to sell. And Mary Lou is kind of like a, a drama queen and also supposed to be like, you know, kind of a diva. How much fun do you have playing those two characters in the videos that you did? Well, Pam is another one that's the the other one that's really fun. And she was a bartender and she is kind of I inspired. I couldn't find her name. I couldn't find. I'm so sorry. Oh, Pam. Pam. Yeah. Well, Mary Lou is the, has blonde hair, mm-hmm. but Pam has like the brown mullet. And Pam, Pam, I don't know. They're, they're all a little piece of me, but. Pam, which I ended up naming her out of the blue, but she does kind of look like this waitress that used to work at the diner in her little town. Her name was Pam, and she had a a big puffy in the front, you know. And they're fun. I mean, it's basically like it's it's they're basically like my um, my id, so to speak, you know. Well, I thought the one, the funniest thing that I saw was a little mm-hmm. blooper at the end of the video. And if I'm not mistaken, you said maybe it was your son or somebody else that you knew that was driving by in the truck. Oh no, that it was a stranger. It was, oh, a was total it? Stranger. okay. <laughs> For some reason, I thought it, I thought you'd said son or something, but it was a stranger. Okay. Yeah, I said that child just saw me with a mustache. <laughs> is what I said. <laughs> Followed by uh, a good bit of uncontrollable laughter. Oh my gosh. And that was before we started. Like we shot, we were just setting up at that point. And Jim Steve was the first to be um, shot. And okay. I was just sitting in that truck, which I borrowed that truck from a friend. And it was a road that barely anyone ever drives on. And oh God. And then here comes somebody, <laughs> you know, driving another vehicle and like looking at me. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh God. <laughs> so perfect well i think they stopped to ask if you're okay or something Uh, yeah they did they did (laughs) and i'm like don't look in this truck too much (laughs) don't look too because that doesn't seem sketchy at all not at all that there's a camera (laughs) and a person who's drawn a mustache on their face (laughs) right right oh god and that's, I assume, the same road that you're playing the guitar in and in, in that um, Mary Lou's walking down the road with her suitcase yes, and all yep, that stuff? Yep, okay. Yep, yep, So for you, it seems like you do have a lot of fun doing uh, videos here and there. Is that something you feel like you want to incorporate more of as the future moves on, especially with this new album? Or do you feel like you're going to continue to really um, hone in on the craft of writing and, and, and making music? Well, I think videos are just so great for content and they're Mm -hmm. fun to do. And, um, yeah, it's basically like I can see this stuff in my mind. So let's do it. Let's make a video. So I do have two more videos coming, um, within the next few months that are songs that are off this new record. So I would, I would love to keep doing videos. They're a lot of work. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, So here and there, I think And Kira is, we're both Ithaca College graduates, so she has a degree in film. So she's just like so, she's so talented and easy to work with and um, professional. And I just have this, you know, this thing that I can't stop seeing in my brain that I'm like trying to explain to her. So um, we're a good team. And I think that, I think we'll just keep plugging, plugging away here and there low pressure yeah yeah yeah. i mean yeah. It, it looks like you have a lot of fun doing it, it looks like you like playing the characters oh, um, man that was I mean, so especially fun. if they're your ids like <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know if you saw the one where um 
Pam is announcing the album to Jim Steve and the camper. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that one was <laughs> it was really fun. I shot like, that by myself on my iPad. I was gonna say there's like a minute and a half of you. I should say actually Jim Steve dancing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> again, it looks like you're just having a good time like playing the character and, and yeah. obviously having that type of likability over the screen is something difficult to do, but it helps your brand, it helps your album, it helps, you know, get everything out there. Yeah. Um, in that context, obviously this new album just came out. Hopefully in the spring you'll be able to start uh playing out more. Do you envision the future being more more music do you feel like you're going to tackle another album in a year or two from now or oh yeah or have you even I, thought that far ahead oh we have we have um i have written a bunch of new songs <laughs> so we we have probably like eight songs that are pretty solid that we could put on a new record um it's, it's i don't really have like nobody's really in charge here meaning like a record label would tell you not to release that so you know like record or it's all about timing but um we'll just do it whenever we feel like it i think it's nice to some degree right not to have that overlord hanging over your head telling you what you should or shouldn't do but at the same time is there a a goal for you guys to be able to be signed to a label or do you feel like if someone were to come knocking you would probably just keep it independent and, and move the train along here um that you know we're kind of like flying by the seat of our pants and that mm-hmm. really worked so far. So if something were to uh, like, we're not out there looking for somebody, but you know, if somebody said the right thing. I, I couldn't say that we wouldn't sign something and, and sure. you know, but we're, we're open to all of it. Basically. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I appreciate all your time with me. I, I, I think I've bugged you maybe at this point a little too much, but I appreciate everything. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, well, again, thank you. Janet Batch, You Be the Wolf. Uh, send you to JanetBatch.com. She's also on YouTube as well. If you want to check out any of the videos, um, buy the music, listen to the music, stream it. You can stream it on Spotify. I believe also Amazon Music, and I'm sure every other place that yeah. you get your music from. So get out there, mm-hmm. listen to it, stream it. And uh, if you really like it, reach out. Please do. Please do. Thank you so much again, Janet. Thank you.